Southport got a head start on all the other watering places in the Lancashire coast. They couldn't really get going until the railways were opened. Southport, however, had a first chance, it came in 20 years before them, because of the supply of visitors which came on the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. This had been opened at the beginning of the century. The canal brought visitors from Liverpool, from Manchester, from Wigan. They, uh, the barges came, often carrying 100 visitors at a time. They landed here on that wharf, and then the coaches took them into Southport. And as a result of this, by the middle of the 1820s, Southport was often having 20,000 visitors a, a year, and it established clearly its primacy among the Lancashire resorts. Here I am standing on the roof of the tower of the Scarsbury Hotel. Previously, the Hesketh Arms, which Charles Scarsbury bought when he became really the dominant landlord of Southport. This hotel could be described as the terminus of the canal service to Southport because right out in the distance there was the Leeds to Liverpool Canal. The people disembarked, and down that long road, the coaches could be seen approaching. The most delightful thought about this is that the owner of the coach service was also the licensee of the Scarsbury Hotel, so he took good service, good uh, care that all the uh, passengers from the canal barges were delivered to the Scarsbury Hotel and nowhere else. Lord Street is among my earliest memories. Looking back, I have the most vivid picture, not only of my mother, but of the society that she frequented dressed at the height of Edwardian fashion. Enormous picture hats held on by hat pins. Uh, dresses down to the ground, uh, heavily corseted, and I believe also wearing a modesty vest over the cleavage. Uh, these ladies looked like ships in full sail and with the same sort of majesty as the Royal Navy possessed. I remember my mother used to take a cup of tea with her fashionable friends in a Lord Street resort known as Tom's Japanese Tea House, a place which I came to loathe and long to escape from. One of the few minor pleasures that my father and I enjoyed if we escaped from Tom's Cafe was Pleasureland, which in those days had lots of animated penny in the slot machines. Now only a few rather inferior specimens have survived. All the rest have gone. The greatest victim, I think, of metrication. If only we'd thought of that at the time, I think we could have prevented it and perhaps kept ourselves out of the common market into the bargain. The town hall is associated with my earliest political experience, though hardly with my political memory. In those days, long ago, general elections ran on for some weeks, and the results came out in different days. It was very exciting and dramatic. There was nothing like radio, and therefore the results were flashed across the front of the town hall. My mother attended regularly, night after night, to watch what was this triumph of liberal victories. As Hilaire Belloc said, the accursed power which stands on privilege and goes with women and champagne and bridge broke, and democracy resumed her reign which goes with bridge and women and champagne. 
I was present with my mother, but in fact, uh, hardly in a position to observe what was going on, she was six months pregnant. It was only three months later that I was born, not, I may say, in Southport at all, but in Birkdale. Here I am in Birkdale, and there is behind me is the house where I spent the first seven years of my life. I've always thought I've been born in Birkdale, and physically that is literally true. But what is the Birkdale I'm talking about? When I was born in 1906, Birkdale was an independent UDC, uh, technically in the registration district of Ormskirk, so as to my great surprise, my uh, birth certificate says that I was born in Ormskirk. In the year 1912, after a passionate political campaign, Birkdale amalgamated with Southport. What was passionate about it, I don't know. I know that all the radicals were greatly in favour of the amalgamation, including my father. It was his first political triumph that he, Birkdale became part of Southport. So now I was born in Southport. And for a long time, I used to write in my passport loyally, birthplace, Southport, Lancashire. But what's happened to me now? Southport isn't in Lancashire anymore. It's in an extraordinary place called Merseyside. But Southport, geographically, is not on Merseyside. It's on Ribbleside. So what have I to put? How about I say I was born in Birkdale, or that I was born in Ormskirk, or that I was born on Merseyside, or that I was born on Ribbleside? And the most outrageous thing is what the bureaucrats of Whitehall or something have tried to impose me, that I wasn't born in Lancashire. But they're wrong. I was. I was born in Birkdale, Lancashire, and that's what I stick to. That's how I used to walk to the school in the gutter, so as not to have to mix with the other children on the pavement. And there is the little school. It was kept by the Mrs. Filmers. The remarkable thing about them is that they were actually born in Birkdale. The only in had people who lived in the whole of Birkdale that I knew that had been born there. Otherwise, the school left little mark on me. I remember that I had to sit at the back of the class and read books because all the other children were being taught to read. Of course, I could read long before I went to school. So it was a great waste of time what I did. The other thing I remember is that this enlightened school decided that every child should have a glass of milk at 11 o'clock. And they would, each child was charged a penny for his glass of milk. I didn't like milk, so I was given a glass of water. But it was felt to be inegalitarian if I got free water while they paid a penny for the milk. So I paid a penny for water out of the tap, which I felt also was somewhat wrong. But once egalitarians get going, you never know what damage they can do. I was a little boy in a very political household. My father called himself a young liberal, though he wasn't a bit like the young liberals of nowadays. My mother, I think, felt embarrassed that she wasn't a suffragette, and her embarrassment took the form of being very hostile to the suffragettes, whereas my father, who was always tolerant, thought if women wanted to be suffragettes, they were entitled to be. And he had a story which was one of my favourites, he used to tell me at bedtime, called Chuck Down. This is a story which he often told me about Churchill's visit to Southport in 1909. Uh, the suffragette troubles at big liberal meetings, particularly Churchill's, he exasperated them more than anyone else, particularly because he was himself in favour of votes for women. Uh, it was such that you had to have a hand-picked audience and my father would begin the story by saying how the liberal agent said, I personally guarantee every woman in the audience, every one of them had been checked, there'd be no trouble, Churchill was assured it'd be a nice, quiet meeting. He'd only just begun to speak when from the uh, louvre of the little loft of the, of the hall, there was a woman's cry of votes for women. This was a suffragette who had concealed herself in the attic of the hall two or three days before, and now was in a, an invulnerable position. She couldn't be reached without breaking down a great number of doors because she'd locked them all. 